motivation. Measure meaningful things to make meaningful things more meaningful. I said this in an article I wrote with Brad Dixon. This is uh, the 24 second drill. We do this indoors, 178 meter track. How far can you run in 24 seconds? We measure the first one and then we take eight to 10 minutes off. And then we measure the second one. Uh, the second one we wanna to try to get within five meters of the first one. But here's the motivation. Part of this motivation is what you see on the left. And that is the best times by these athletes um, from three years ago, two years ago, and the year prior. They're also ranked. Um, this also adds motivation. Um, so they can see year to year improvement. They can see improvement between the first one we did on February 7th and the second one we did on February 13th. Not only that, but on the right, you will see um, where they stand among, uh, among 10 years of doing this drill and where they stand among the seniors of the past, the juniors of the past, sophomores of the past. And not only that, by the way, the present team is highlighted in yellow. Not only that, but the guys in red over there were all staters for me in track. So they're able to measure themselves up against previous all state athletes, all state sprinters, which means 100, 200, 400, 110 hurdles, um, 300 hurdles, four by one, four by two, four by four. So these guys in red were all, all staters for me. And so if, if you are ahead of a few all staters and you're not, you haven't been an all stater yet. Hey, you got a lot to be motivated about. Motivation is the fire that starts burning after you manually, painfully coax it into existence and it feeds on the satisfaction of seeing yourself make progress. There's only one recipe for getting motivation and that's success. I think this is so true. I, you know, there are many things that I wanted to be in my life. Um, <laughs> stereos were the centerpiece of my life in, in high school and college. And there's nothing I wanted more than be able to play the guitar and see where that went. And I never got very good at it. Um, matter of fact, I don't think I ever had any success at all in playing the guitar, even though I bought two of them. Um, I played for five years, but eventually I gave up because hard work does not necessarily make you successful. Um, I just, I just wasn't very good at it. Now, if I could have had some type of teacher that could have shown me how I was becoming more successful, how I was making progress. Possibly I would have stayed with it. So I think this is an important thing for all coaches to think about. Am I giving my kids any feedback that is, that is true factual stuff, you know, like data that shows that they are making progress? I think most coaches don't. It's really weird. They, they, they don't show anything. And, uh, and I don't think kids will be motivated if they're not successful. There's one other thing I want to mention here. You know how some track coaches, a lot of typical track coaches will lie about pre previous times to get an athlete into a faster heat. Um, I've done that too, except for, I will turn in a slow time so that my athlete can run in a slower heat and win the damn thing. Because I know that winning is a performance enhancing drug. Remember winning is part of that dopamine thing. Winning is really important. So anytime you can put a kid into a situation where he is successful or feels successful, that is motivation. Band of brothers. Remember I talked about teamwork being something that, 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 humans, homo sapiens, they, they just love, love the, uh, the band of brothers teamwork thing. It's in our DNA. Uh, caveman loved it. Uh, and the Egyptians loved it. It's always the case. Um, improved teamwork, just like it improved survival chances back, you know, in the olden days, um, probably still does, uh, improves our chances to win in sports. 
it's really important to understand that as primates, we are kind of weak and worthless. If we were in a survival situation with another primate, like a chimp, um, they would they would kill us. They would tear us limb from limb. Their jaws can snap our bones. Um, their hands are so much more um, so much stronger than ours. Their ability to climb, to run. Um, we are like the weakest physical primate in the world. And just like the woolly mammoth, um, we are no match for most animals in the animal kingdom because we are weak. But the woolly mammoth was hunted to extinction by man. So how did this happen? How did an inferior athlete um, hunt to extinction these huge animals? Well, it's teamwork. Not just teamwork either. There's something else that goes along with teamwork. I bet there was a leader in this group. I bet they, the leader motivated and demonstrated and planned and practiced and held each other accountable and all these things. I bet there was a lot of trust going on among this team. Sounds like everything that we're trying to get our team to do, except for their goal was to kill a huge animal. And our goal is to win a football game or win a race or something. And I think this where you know, Steve Jones, beautiful book, uh, the twin thieves is so cool with Matt Campbell, um, on, on, as, as our keynote speaker, how he said, this was most, one of the most powerful books he'd ever read. And one of the things that Steve says that, that really stands out, uh, to me is that is your culture intentional or by default? Um, so many things with our teams and the way we coach, we just are what we are. And, you know, we'll, you know, coaches will bitch about, we don't have any leaders in this team. Need, somebody needs to stand up and speak up and, but we don't teach anybody how to be better leaders. Uh, Steve Jones <laughs> basically lays out the entire blueprint here on how to develop leadership that will take your team further than you can ever imagine. Just like culture is either intentional or by default, I think championships are too. Um, championships are all, not always the result of culture. Uh, sometimes championships are the result of having um, strangely great athletes and has very little to do with anything you did as a coach. But the teams that are the most fun to coach are the teams that, um, that win by uh, being intentional, by by have, doing all those things that, that you're supposed to be doing in order to get better and have greater, better leadership and, and all that stuff. Uh, the 10th thing, 10th and final thing here, uh, the positive feedback loop. I love this slide. Um, feed the cats coaches create happy and healthy, high performance practice environment. In other words, it's kind of like a gardener producing a fertile soil. Um, with the right, with the right mission in mind. And that is well-rested, happy and healthy athletes coming to perform on high performance days in practice. When you set that up, you affect your athletes because you will affect them because they will be happier and healthier because they're happier and healthier and buy into the rest thing. They were they will perform in practice, not just go through the motions, not just work as hard as they can work. And the coach yells at them more effort, more effort, not just that, but they will actually start performing in practice. When that happens, athletes will start seeing practice differently. Athletes will see practice as the best part of their day. Myself, I can remember on one of the, let's say three nice days every spring, I would look out the window and see the blue sky and, and, the, and the clouds and the windows would be open in the classroom and it felt glorious. You know, summer was over and I'd think to myself, this would be the greatest day of all times if I didn't have track practice. I, I saw track practice as being awful and most, most track athletes do. It's just the hell you got to go through to get to run in the meets. 
Well, when athletes start bouncing into practice, the coach gets inspired by his athletes. I've always said that the greatest teams of mine had athletes that inspired me. I was not the slave driver with a whip. I had athletes that came and like, if I did not bring my best effort, I would be sad because I was letting those kids down. And I think the coach becomes more enthusiastic. You know, remember we, we are copycats. We imitate those around us. The typical coach goes to practice every day with a demoralized, depressed group because they have to practice. And so the coach has to be a son of a bitch to get him to do anything. And then the coach is in such a bad mood when he goes home that he beats his wife. Not really, but you, you understand what I'm talking about. You know, that coaches have to be mean to their teams in order to get them to, to fight through the fatigue and the pain and the depression and all that stuff. Well, a feed the cat situation, the coaches get happier. And they get to go home and love their wife. So anyway, <laughs> it just grows then with the more enthusiastic coach the coach creates even he's looking for constantly f for ways to make his practices better to make them happier healthier more high performance and and it's just it, it's a feedback loop that i think this is why i'm still coaching at the age of 62 um 40 years of of, of coaching at the high school level and uh, i'm happier right now as a coach than i've ever been the other side of the coin, Monday, I hate track. Tuesday, I hate track. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I hate track every damn day. This is B.J. Stevens who ran for, uh, uh, ran the hurdles for Purdue. And, uh, and it's important to note that this guy got 934 retweets on this. If, if you're not on Twitter, you don't understand. But, I mean, I get a lot of retweets on some tweets, but, you know, like 100 is like, like the most or something. Or, you know, like you know like my record is like 1000 likes or something and he got 3800 for this very uh depressing tweet and of course on meat day he loves track but on sunday his body hurts and he hates it again so he hates track six days a week and you know um he thinks it's somewhat funny and then he has the crying face and is like well that i'm just being honest so there must be you know this tweet just struck a chord among track athletes everywhere. It's like, yeah, that's my experience too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. I hate track. Well, what I would like <laughs> to think is that if I was BJ Stevens coach at Purdue, um, that he would have been a much better athlete for me because I would not have allowed him to hate track. You know, I would have created the fertile soil to, uh, for him to see meaning and significance in what we were doing and if we needed to back off of what we were doing with him uh, to eliminate soreness or, or do better with depression or whatever, we would have done it. Because I think happy and healthy athletes are better than people who hate it. Kids are real good at what they like. They're obsessed with what they love. This is one of my uh, quotes here. You know, I, I say this all the time. And I, I think that, you know, in school, we just don't give a damn. You know, that kids hate school and, and we're okay with it. And and then in sports, I think they hate practice. They, they love the games. Like I said, you know, everybody loves the team thing. You know, they love the uniforms. They love the prestige. They love the games, but they hate practice and we're okay with it. Uh, I think if we make practice the best part of a kid's day, which ain't very hard because um, the rest of their day sucks too. Um, if we made practice something they look forward to. And even when it was hard, they saw why it was hard. They saw meaning and significance. You know, like when we have a hard practice, uh, a lactate workout in track, they know the next day we have an off day. We're, we go home after school and take a nap. So they understand that, yes, today's going to hurt like hell, but tomorrow we have a day off. So, so I think that, you know, once coaches start thinking like this, um, they will tap into some magic that they've never seen before. It's a good time to be a cat. Uh, I think it's important for Feed the Cats coaches to understand the success going on all over the nation. Uh, Coach Matt Tebow from Rice Lake was at the consortium, at this Iowa consortium. He's here, and he coached Kenny Benark 
in high school at Rice Lake, Wisconsin. So, so Kenny Benarek, in high school at least, was trained in a feed the cats way. You know, he never ran more than 200 meters in practice, happy, healthy, rested, all those great things. Um, and, you know, he made the Olympic team this year. This guy also was uh, a product of a Feed the Cats high school. Um, Hopkins, Minnesota, or uh, Minneapolis. Uh, Joseph Fambala uh, ran for Nick Lovis. Nick Lovis brought a staff of seven. It's the biggest staff uh, attendance of a TFC ever, uh, like four years ago. And, uh, and that was the year I think Joseph was maybe a sophomore um, that year. And... You know, he just really excelled, and he was he was treated he was trained like a cat. He wasn't trained uh, like a workhorse, and obviously he had a good set of genes. But maybe maybe the genes went further because they treated him like a racehorse, and not a workhorse. Uh, Marcellus Moore ran for me, of course, um, at age 18 this past season. He turned 19 on June 30th. Um, but at age 18, he ran wind legal, uh, not wind aided, but wind legal 10.12, which currently ranks number two in the world for under 20. Number two in the world under 20, that's pretty good. You know, there's a lot of people that say, oh, Marcellus Moore, he's been babied so much in high school, he'll never step up to the college level and be very good. I'm like, shut up, he's gonna do fine. Um, five, six, 149, uh, he's up to 159 now. He looks big and strong. But here he's running against the old Justin Gatlin, who uh, at this in this picture was uh, was like uh, 21 years older than Marcel's, more than twice his age. Kamari Montgomery uh, was a Feed the Cats product in high school. John Piero at Plainfield Central. I'm at Plainfield North. Um, coached this cat. He was a triple champ in high school, uh, triple crown winner, 100, 200, 400, and uh, ran 46 low in the 400, which is really fast. In 2018, he was national champion, running a 44.58. In 2019, he was NCAA champ, running for Houston. Um, and now he's a professional. So uh, just another guy that never ran more than 200 practice, happy, healthy, um, you know, sleep, all that good stuff. And then Brandon Battle. This guy, I, I know this guy was trained as a cat because my son Alec at Edwardsville coached him. Uh, Bram Battle was only the second guy. The first guy was this guy. The second guy is this guy to win the Illinois Triple Crown. And his time was very similar to Kamari's. He got a full ride to Arkansas. He signed the other day. But 46.48 um, on, on a day, on a year where times were slow in Illinois, this guy was by far uh, had, the, uh, had the greatest day um, anybody could ever imagine on that day. And then, I love this. Jim Jarofsky from Lincoln High School in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, sent me um, what his team has done since attending their first TFC several years ago and following a Feed the Cats approach and all that. I don't usually think of South Dakota as being like a fast state, you know, like a Texas-type speed state. But these guys are doing pretty good. In the last five years... They've won eight boys and girls state titles. That's There's a total of 10. They've won eight of the 10, boys and girls. Boys and girls, state records in the four by one. You know, that's the pissing contest of sprint coaches, the four by one. Uh, their boys ran this year 41.98 and the girls ran uh, 47.84. This year, the boys and girls set school records in the hundred. Their fastest boy ran 1054. Their fastest girl went 1188. Now, remember, this is a school in South Dakota on a COVID year. Pretty impressive. And then this is what I love the most. Everybody's always saying, like, yeah, maybe Feed the Cats is good for the short sprints, but the 4x4, four four, you got to run those guys. That's an effort race. That's a courage race, blah, blah, blah. Well, fast athletes run the 4x4 four four well. You know, slow athletes do not. So, so their speed, they had to win the 4x4 four four this year to win the boys' state title. And they did. That's a pretty good time for South Dakota, 321.80. So I'm really proud of Jim. He's a fellow chemistry teacher, and I love that. 
And uh, uh, congratulations to Lincoln High School, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. In 1927, there was a, a conference. They, they said this is the smartest picture ever taken. I believe there's 19 Nobel Peace Prize, Peace Prize winners here. Um, 1927 was the year they were all talking about quantum physics in Solvay, France. Um, in the front row, you see uh, one woman, the only woman in this group, and this is Marie Curie. You see Einstein in the middle. Einstein went to the first conference in 1911, where he was the youngest guy there. And then over on the far right was his buddy, Niels Bohr. And then two of my favorite scientists in the back, that's Schrodinger and Heisenberg. Um, that's also the name of my two fancy football teams, Schrodinger and Heisenberg. So this picture, you know, reminds me kind of what TFC is all about. We're, we're getting together some of the uh, best coaches in America and sharing ideas. And, and kids are going to be better off for it. And, you know, I started thinking maybe this is a bad picture to show because these guys are all real smart and we're just coaches. And then I think, you know, in some ways, coaches change the world more than scientists. Uh, you know, the, the trust we develop with kids, the mentoring, the love we give them, you know, all, all those things, uh, I think maybe echo in eternity, even more than, you know, the, the newest findings of quantum physics. So, uh, so yeah, it's kind of cool to think, uh, uh, about what we're doing at TFC. If I've seen further than others, it's because is because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. It's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Isaac Newton said this. Basically, this is just a tribute to the scientists before him, um, his teachers, the people who got him to see further than others. And Isaac saw a lot further than others. And, you know, I, I think we should all think about that from time to time. I know, you know, I look back and, and you know, my, my father was just such a, uh, an influence on me. You know, I went everywhere with him. I was his wingman. He talked to me like I was an adult when I was a little kid. Um, he listened to me um, when I was a head basketball coach and he was a head college basketball coach. We used to call each other on Saturday mornings and uh, we could talk forever. You know, our phone bill was pretty high back then. Uh, so um, I think of, you know, all of that and how I got a head start on coaches. Um, because I lived it for so long. And, um, and now, of course, the, the second generation of, of Feed the Cats coaches are going to see even further than I ever did. Uh, when people send me good stuff, you know, when they send me, um, like Jim Jarofsky, you know, all the great things he's doing at Sioux Falls, South Dakota, um, I usually send back something that, in, that includes the word, you inspire me. And, and, you know, don't ever hesitate to reach out and tell me about all of your successes because in, in a way, your successes are mine um, and and my successes are yours because we're all in this damn thing together. And I think the connection of TFC and the connection of coaches that say they feed the cats, which is nothing more than I value ha happy and healthy and rested athletes that perform in practice and see meaning and significance in what they do and they love what they do. Um, if, if, if you're against feed the cats and you're against those things, really? You're against happy and healthy athletes who are rested and perform in practice and love what they do? You're against that? So, uh, so anyway, uh, don't ever, uh, don't ever think that, that words do not inspire. And, and I think that if we lived in a world where people inspired each other more often, we'd probably be a better world. If you ever need anything, um, there's a lot of stuff that I offer. So I'll leave this on the screen for a few seconds. And, um, I'm more than willing now that I'm retired from chemistry teaching, uh, I've been doing some uh, two-day speed camps. Did one in uh, in Scottsdale and one in Atlanta and one in uh, Narragansett, Rhode Island. Um, I'm consulting with a couple schools, Penn and Princeton and Lacrosse. I'm headed towards uh, to Northwestern this week to talk with their lacrosse uh, staff. And um, you know, I got to do a couple entire athletic department gigs: one on Zoom, one in person. 
Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, me and my two sons can do feed the cat seminars. Um, but we're working with athletes or working with coaches. It can be a clinic or whatever you want it to be. Just reach out. I have my cell phone number um, and uh, and my email address down here at the bottom. Thanks so much, and I look forward to seeing you again someday.